Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this lecture. The main topic of this presentation will be software engineering in the broadcasting world and all the different transformation that, happens over the that happened over the last decades in, the bro in broadcasting. My name is Vincent Trissard. I'm chief software architect at Grass Valley. I've been in this industry for more than 20 years, so it makes me sound really old. However, it's not unusual to have engineers and software engineers staying in broadcasting for a very long time. And there's good, there are good reasons for that. P typically, when you join broadcasting, you don't leave. Multiple reasons. First, and the most obvious reason, is that you may be working on a piece of software, a piece of hardware, architecting something that will be used, live, and contribute to a production that is enjoyed by billions of users at the same time, at the same moment in time, live such as Formula One races. Last year, Formula One had about 440 million viewers. Olympics, billions of, of viewers. Same thing for uh, Mundial uh, f uh, football and so on. So it's very challenging, and you have to be ready to, for the pressure, of course, but it's also a jolt of adrenaline every time you know that your software has been used on air live to and create content that is enjoyed by billions of users. So as software engineer, we know that our code needs to be stable, it needs to be performant, it needs to be secure, it needs to be scalable, have high throughput. But in broadcasting, just take these five or six key values and multiply that by a factor of 10, by an order of magnitude. The show must go on. The software must be extremely reliable. Your, you, your software is used to broadcast an F1 race, it crashes, you cannot c call the race officials and ask them to take out the, the pace car, slow down the race, and reboot your server. Everything has, been, has to be extremely well tested, extremely resilient. You have to think about all the failure modes, identify all the single point of failures, and test a lot, test quite a lot to make sure that it is very resilient. Oh, before I forget, the, the last positive aspect of working in broadcast is that you will be finally able to tell your parents what you do for a living, and they will understand. <laughs> I've been working in a different industry when I was uh, younger, and I literally could not explain to my parents what EGB 1.0 and stateful session beans were. <laughs> Broadcasting, it's easy. You just point them to a TV show, and they will understand. So. All of you here consume media content. We used to call that broadcast media. It's now media in general because the, the, the delivery mechanisms have changed. In the past, you were watching televisions. You were watching a tube television with antennas or maybe a satellite dish or a satellite feed or potentially now uh, HTTP streaming or uh, web streaming using Net Netflix, uh, Disney Plus or YouTube. The mechanism to consume media have changed drastically over the years. We went from analog, digital, and web. However, content still needs to be produced. You need to author, capture, create live events or create offline events like movies. You need to play them, distribute them, and get them to the viewer. This is what we do. At Grass Valley, we create these tools enabling the broadcasters and the media brands. We call, we call them media brands now, not even broadcasters, because they may not even broadcast anything. They may just deliver over the web. So the media brands that you know, I won't name them, but pretty much 80% or 90% of all the media brands use Grass Valley equipment to create content that you enjoy. Last point. I need to apologize to all of you. Uh, we are partly responsible for the destruction of planet Alderaan in Star Wars in the first movie. I'll cover that a bit later. So what's the agenda for this presentation? I'm going to give you a very high-level overview of broadcasting concepts. What are the tools that we create? What, do you, what are the tools that you need to create uh, a program, a television uh, program or a live event? A very, very brief overview of broadcasting, just a couple slides. We at Grass Valley are building a cloud-first broadcasting solution. It comes with lots of challenges, so I'll cover that also. Uh, and if we have time, a couple of customer use cases and a Q&A session. I'm going to run a very short video, just one minute. To, uh, please have a look uh, at the images. If you, see, if you look at tools, different panels, equipment, uh, if you see things that are specific to broadcast, don't worry, I'm going to cover them after this presentation and tell you actually what you saw in this presentation.
in this short video, you saw quite a lot of tools. It was fast-paced, so I'm going to take some time to explain what what are these tools and then why do we need these? Why do we need them? The first one on the right is called a production switcher. I guess many of you know how to create movies, maybe in Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere or even iMovie. These are called non-linear editor. You're creating your content, you're creating your movie using offline media, media that is available, non-real-time media, media that is available on tapes, on, on files, you have your clips, your logo, your animations, and you have time to create your output, your composition, or your clips. In the live world, none of that works. So you need a tool, you need a console, something that is extremely quick to use, allowing you to create your content as it happens. So it achieves the same goal. You are editing and creating content, but in the context of a live production. So this looks scary, lots of buttons. Uh, the, and these consoles can be very small or huge, and they can deal with dozens, if not hundreds, of video signal up to Ultra HD or 4K. So just think about it. You have 100 signals coming in. Each of them are running at 12 gigabits per second. All of them needs to be fed into the production switcher, and they need to be available instantly. So as I press a button, I want to cut to that new camera. I want to perform an action, a transition, an effect on this new uh, signal. 100 times 12 gigabits all coming into the same piece of hardware or software needs to be processed, monitored, and uh, available for quick action instantly. So you have rows of buttons. Typically, the buttons are mapped to inputs. And then you have multiple, what we call buses, or where on which you can apply effects. So I have my graphics, I have my animation, my logos. Or I want to create a picture-in-picture, -picture, or two, two cameras, two remote cameras talking to each other, two users in an interview. I want to squeeze back the picture. I want to overlay them on, uh, on behind, uh, on front of a moving background. All of that can be done live with this, these buttons. The person operating this desk is called a technical director, and this person is almost a pianist. They can actually they know by heart the location of every button, and they can cut a show live. They can actually play the show as the event occurs. Formula One uh, and all, everything I said at the beginning. So you will find these production switchers wherever there is something live to be produced. It has additional features allowing you to do FX. You can actually pre-program your typical transition. That's why when you look at a football game or any kind of event, you typically always have the same kind of trans trans uh, transitions. It's good to build a brand because it's actually always the same look, but there is also a technical reason for that. These transi transitions have been pre-programmed in, uh, in the memory banks of these uh, production switchers. This is mission critical. If it goes down, there is no more, no more show, no more event. There is not much that can be done without it. So if this crashes, you fall back to some pre-recorded feeds or just a couple signals, and you manu manually si switch them until this reboots. So please don't crash. This must never crash. On the right, you have a replay panel, typically part of a replay workstation. Replay is, as it says, something that works closely to the produ production switcher you are looking at video signals, action shots, like football. I'm from Canada, so it's all we use for hockey, so I'll talk about hockey. So someone is looking at the cameras, being fed into the, 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 the replay panel. If uh, something happens, there's a goal, a fight, a cross-check, or anything like that, someone is able to roll back, the operator is able to roll back using the wheel or a button, minus five seconds, minus 10 seconds, switch back instantly, and the instant aspect is critical here. You have a couple seconds to create a highlight for that event that happened. Everything is recorded all the time. So we rec record all the cameras, write them to SSDs, using a format that is easy to encode, easy to decode, will not overwhelm the SSDs or, or, the, or the storage system, and needs to be available in real time. Yeah, doing it for a single video stream, I guess there are many of you here who should be able to do that. What if you have hundreds or dozens of UHD cameras coming in and that you have to do the same thing, encode all of them, you need to process all of them and uh, write them to disk. So great technical challenge, very fun. Again, as software engineers, we like challenges. This is a big one. Another interesting one as well, if you want to do super slow-mos, uh, there's a goal, there's an action shot, I want to slow down. How do you slow down? Well, you can actually interpolate the pictures and invent pictures. 
It's typically OK if you want to inter interpolate 2x, slow down by a factor of 2. What if you want to slow down by a factor of 6? It's, well, it's going to look rubbish. So you need to capture high frame rate video. OK, that's fine. I'll, it. I'll use cameras. I may use camera, high speed cameras that will give me six phases. So if you're running at 50 frames per second times six, you have 300 frames per second to capture your video coming as six uh, separate phases. And as you slow down or speed up using the, t the metallic T bar on the side, this bar will tell the, uh, the system how many frames they need to consume to achieve a smooth motion. There's a slight problem. If you look at this lighting system here, it's locked to 50 hertz electrical signal. So you have a waveform that is, it gets very bright, very dark, very bright, very dark. You don't notice it because you have persistence of vision uh, in your retina. However, the system doesn't have persistence of vision. You will capture dark frames, bright frames, dark frames, bright frame. So you need to process your frames in real time as they come in, all of them, all camera, all phases, and uh, average the luminance over time so you have some consistent light level across uh, all the images. Challenging, because you are now pushing six times the frame rate for every camera that you are uh, feeding into the system. If you're thinking, for example, uh, Formula One, you may have cameras alongside the racetrack, cameras in the car, helmet cam, driver cam, front-facing cam, backwards-facing cam, crowds, interviewees. So we're talking hundreds of cameras sometimes. So you need to choose which one you're recording, and you need to make it super efficient. Again, as a challenge for a software engineer, this is what we like. So this one is a inter super interesting uh, challenge to crack and implement in software, and in, in hardware, and now in software. Uh, on this screen here, we have, uh, well, so, so you've captured your content with cameras. We make cameras. Uh, you uh, produce it with a live production switcher or uh, a replay workstation. Now that you have your content, you need to ingest it, so encode it and put it as files, record it as files. Or you may have content that you have received from your uh, customer or partners. Uh, we're so on your phones, you may have uh, iPhoto or a photo app of your phone. This, these are asset management uh, applications. You're just capturing all the files, indexing them, and it's an easy way for you to find the files. What if you have millions of hours of content? So our, our, partner, our customers may have millions of hours of content every month from, for all the channels they support. So they need to index the media. They need to find content uh, as well. So for example, when we record some content in our asset management solution, we actually are extracting the text out of the voice. So we're using, uh, doing audio description or audio transcription from voice to text and indexing the whole conversation in the clip. So if you want to find something, you actually find it based on text. As the content is being recorded, as it is being ingested, as we, as we call, uh, either from files or from live streams, we make the frames, the video content available in a web browser for editors to start doing their non-linear, uh, live non-linear ed editing of the shows as it happens. I'll cover that a bit later with customer use cases, but this is very, very flexible because you can actually start creating your highlight reels, creating your news events, your show summary as the event occurs. So, for example, the Olympics, there's something happening. Someone can actually create the highlight reel and create some content for tonight. Tonight, there will, there will be a summary of the, uh, the Olympic day. Well, the content can be created as, we, as it's happening. So super efficient web interfaces, uh, critical, cr cr critical comp component of broadcasting. On the right, we al you also need to manipulate and do something with these assets. So you cannot keep content forever. So Based on some criteria, you need to push it to Glacier, for example. You may need to transcode it, make it available on the web, uh, move the files. So a very strong and resili resilient workflow engine is also essential when you need to manage a lot of assets. So you've captured with a camera, you've produced, you've done your asset management, you've created some content. Now you need to deliver it. You need to put it on air, and air can be airwaves or can be a, a HTTP service or web services. So this is a playout screen. Playout is the last step before we play out or we put on air. So 
in Poland here you have uh, TVP. TVP has, I, I was on Wikipedia yesterday trying to get the exact number right, but I saw a, couple, multi, two dozen, uh, a dozen or, or more of different channels owned and operated by uh, TVP. So on the left side, you would see all your channels. In the, uh, the middle, you would, you would see the, the, schedule, the schedule of these channels. So everything needs to be put on air according to a schedule. Your TV guide, this is basically where it comes from. So this is going to, at, at noon, we're going to have news, and then uh, an hour, uh, half an hour later, we're going to have this movie. It's going to be broken into commercial every 20 minutes. Commercial break, we'll have four commercials. We need to add subtitles. We need to add um, uh, voiceovers. All of that can be do done by a playout uh, solution, a playout, uh, multi-channel playout solution. Again, you need to think about failure modes because this thing cannot crash. It cannot fail. So you have to implement lots of very defensive programming techniques. Most of you must be using Chrome. So in Chrome, if you look in Task Manager, you will see that every tab is a sub-process allowing you to sandbox from a security point of view the content of the tab. So they didn't have to do that, but by isolating every tab in a sub-process, you have security isolation, but you also have resilience and stability. If a tab goes down, it doesn't bring down the whole browser. We use similar techniques, so by building microservices, making sure that we actually extract the risky bit. For example, we receive a file from a customer, an MP4 file, a MOV file, or an MXF file that we use in broadcasting. We typically don't trust the file, don't trust anything. So we run the decoding process, the demultiplexing process, the decode, well, yeah, demultiplexing decoding process in sub-processes. If something dies, well, that clip, that clip goes down, but at least the solution stays up. So everything we, knew, we do, we need to think about sandboxing isolation to make sure that we don't have these uh, crashes on air. Yeah, and typically doing one channel is easy. If you do hundreds of channels all the time at once on air, this is where the complexity happens. And all of that needs to be uh, user interactive as well. If there is uh, an explosion somewhere, uh, an issue with a president somewhere, a news flash, and you need to interrupt the schedule, you need to be, you need to be able to pause everything, go to a live event, and come back uh, maybe where the show should have been, or you, so you hold the sequence, or you just join in progress. So we missed everything because there was a new flash, and we join in progress uh, where we should have been. In the list here, you have what we call primary events. So these would be files or live events, so file assets that we put on air, a movie, a commercial, or a live event. Typically, for example, the news, the news show coming from a newsroom. So the news is actually delivered as a live stream into the playout solution. And then you have your secondary assets, which would be commercials, you would be uh, triggers. You may actually insert triggers in the system to let your players, uh, like Netflix, not, not Netflix, but maybe YouTube, let them know that they are entitled to insert commercial at specific points. So commercial management, availability zone. So in this time, I'm allowed to insert commercial. In this other time, I'm not allowed to insert commercials. So all of that is, can be driven by playout. So subtitle, transcription, voiceovers, everything is driven as a secondary events in playout. Again, going back to the five uh, attributes that I had at the beginning, security, re resiliency, I covered that. Scalability, you want to do this, this operation, only one channel on a, on a server, typically a dual Xeon server. It gets very expensive per hour, so we want to run four, eight channels in parallel on a server and make sure that channel one doesn't have an impact on channel two. You have proper isolation protection between your channels. So efficiency of code is critical to make sure that it, is, it makes financial sense for the customer. On the left, so in the previous video, you saw these vans. This is, we, at Grass Valley, we don't manufacture, we don't sell OB vans, but we sell all the tools and the equipment that goes inside the van. So these vans are, are actually quite amazing. They go to the venue or the event, so if there's an Olympics, a concert, they actually roll in the parking lot connect the electricity to get some power and expand. So if you go on YouTube and search for Obivan, um, Obivan Motor, yeah, I see some, some videos, it's pretty amazing. It expands and it's, it's a complete production studio on wheels. So encoders, uh, to, uh, streaming box to stream to the cloud, uh, production switchers, uh, replay panels, uh, control system, all of that is available in these trucks. 
From a software engineering point of view, the main challenge here is power efficiency. The amount of electricity that you're allowed to use in these servers is actually quite limited. There's a, there's a power budget. If you're in a server room, you typically think less about that. But in these vans, it's actually critical to think about the power budget. So in some cases, using FPGA-based uh, modules may make more sense than using a big server uh, with dual NVIDIA RTX 4080 Ti, which consume one terawatt hour per, per card. So uh, you have to be careful about your power consumption. You have to make sure that your code is extremely efficient so you don't go overboard with power consumption. On the right, you have a multi-viewer. You may have seen that uh, previously. So multi-viewer does what it says in its name. You actually see multiple inputs. Yeah, that's easy. You can do that on your, uh, on your PC. Uh, what if I ask you to create a multi-viewer that is displaying 96 or 64 UHD streams, so 12 gigabits per stream coming over IP, or potentially compressed that you have to decompress, move all the pictures over PCI Express, mm, 12 time, 96 times 12 gig may not go well over PCI Express, PCI Express. If you need to capture it from the network, then actually get it from the network and then you send it back to the GPU, that's, that's quite a lot. So you may have to think, well, maybe I should pre-scale the picture and before I push it to the GPU. Yes, but now you're pre-scaling on the CPU and you're keeping your CPU very busy. So you have to be smart about where you do your optimization, where you do the smart stuff. There may be ways to pre-scale whilst the, the picture is already in cache and then you just do a bit of scaling and then you, f you finish the scaling in the GPU. You may scale based on the intent, not based on the, the size of the picture. There are lots of tricks you can do. But again, lots of CUDA optimization, lots of GPU optimization. You have to think about every kind of bottlenecks you can have, PCI Express, memory bandwidth, even the order of the dims on a server. It's, <laughs> it's actually quite important to fill all the dims in a Xeon uh, server or every other dim because you'll get non-deterministic non non um, uh, latencies. And again, latency is super important in broadcast. So you want to, the technical director will be looking at the multi-viewer and whenever he takes a decision, the decision should be made on what he sees. So if the image is late by a second, then the action, the decision that the technical director is doing is wrong. You may cut, you may actually get the wrong action, the wrong sequence. So this needs to be low latency and scalable. Again, as geeks, as software engineers, we love that. We love these challenges. So finally, when you have all these components in your system, you need to orchestrate everything. You need to control. You need to configure everything. You need to move your flows around. If you have thousands of flows coming in, thousands of streams coming in, dozens of streams coming out, going out, you have to make sure that your signal, path, signal flow is correct. All the configuration of every device is, um, is correct as well. So we also have solution. We need a solution, and we have one, of course, to orchestrate all the devices in a broadcast facility. So I promised I would cover that. So again, we're sorry. For some reason, I don't have any sound. Commence primary ignition. <laughs> So you may have noticed this. So in the, uh, the Death Star, the control panel is actually a production switcher from Grass Valley. So <laughs> in 1976, so maybe a year before the first movie came out in 1977, George Lucas was looking for something that looks, not alien, but that looks very fancy, very high tech. So he went to his local TV station in Los Angeles and asked them permission to shoot their production consoles and get some nice angles, some fancy lighting effects, so it actually looks like something that would live in the Death Star. So we're sorry. So I'm going to go very rapidly on uh, a short history of broadcasting. Uh, the, um, it won't be thorough. It's going to just explain why we have the hard things we have to do. It's actually rooted in decisions that were taken 
almost 100 years ago now. So I won't go into the mechanical, me mechanical television. So if you're, if you're curious, Google that. Many mechanical televisions with spinning disks. It's amazing. It had a resolution of five pixels by five pixels. So you need to, you need to use your imagination to get some pictures out of that. So it, of course, it didn't work. What really worked is electronic television. So moving an electron beam left, right, top to bottom using uh, magnetic coils to move the beam. We're still stuck with that. So this was the, the, at the heart of the uh, analog television, so analog distribution, analog televisions. So what you see to the right is called an inter interlacing artifacts. Why do we see that? In 1920, 1930, we were unable, they were, I wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> they were unable to display a full 60 frames per second or a full 50 frames per second over the, the airwaves. There was not enough bandwidth to carry a full 60 image per second in SD resolution, standard resolution. Why do we want 50 frames per second? Why do we want 60 frames per second? If you go below that threshold, the image on a tube on a CRT starts flickering. If you want to see flickering images, go on the second, uh, second floor here in the Arcade Museum and just look at the screens. They just flicker all the time. So to prevent headaches and make, pe make sure that people actually want to watch this thing, we have to display something at higher frame rates. 50 hertz, 60 hertz. Why 50? It's actually locked to the electrical system again. In, uh, in Europe, why 60 in North America? Well, our power grid is, is running at 60 hertz. So electron beam draws every other line. So line one, three, five, seven, goes to the bottom, get the electrical signal phase kick to go back up, and renders the second half image. So instead of rendering full images, we're rendering half images to give the illusion of motion. Actually, because there is motion between, between these fields, it's called a field. So full frame is a frame, fields are half images that are displayed sequentially. It's a bit of a shame because all our screens today and for the last 10 years, 15 years, they're all progressive. They're all a perfectly able to display these nice full frames. We have this, these projectors, your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your screen. Everything is progressive. If you use your TV remote, you go to the advanced settings and you look at the details of the stream coming in from your satellite receiver or your national broadcaster, it is very likely to be 1080i, still interlaced as of today. Historical artifact, we're still broadcasting in that format because it's difficult to change the full transmission chain. So if you end up with images that look like this, well, you need to do something about it. You need to convert from high field rate to high frame rate. You need to invent pixels. So you have, you have a, full, a field, every other line is black. You don't see it on a, on a TV because, again, you have persistence of vision and your, your brain is able to remember what was displayed in the last line. However, if you need to animate, scale, move images, animating these images will look absolutely rubbish. It will be impossible to do anything, any kind of high-quality broadcast production with this kind of image. So you need to invent standard conversions, st video standards converter, the interlacing algorithm. You may have different approaches. The first one is the, e the trivial one, just blend the field. Well, this is what you get. So maybe I can actually measure motion vectors in my image, my previous image. So my pixel or my block was here, and it, it, I think it was there, and it moved there. So based on the motion vector, you can take a decision. You know what? I'll invent a pixel here because I think this is the vector of my pixel. Works great most of the time. What about a reveal? So I have someone standing here. There's a car that goes in front and leaves. So I was not, my pixels, my personal pixels were not on screen uh, when the car was there. And then suddenly within a frame, I'm here. So how do you invent anything? How do you make up these pixels? So you have to come up with very, very smart algorithms to, to create something that looks very decent, very good when you have to invent these pixels. Same thing when you have recorded something in North America and you want to play it in Europe. You're going from 50 hertz to 60 or from 60 hertz to 50 hertz or the other way around when you want to play something captured in Europe and North America and, and so on. So you need to invent pixels, you need to look at your time, the sequence of frames and slice new images in, the, in between and construct new images. 
you must take the right decision because it can look rubbish very rapidly. Again, as engineers, we like that stuff. So, yeah, so that's, that, that's kind of the kind of challenges that we have to deal with again today because of decisions that were taken about 100 years ago. So we went from full uh, analog broadcasting to digital broadcasting, but still linear distribution. So started in the late, well, in the 1990s, completed in around 2010, so it was called the analog shutoff. So this broadcasting an analog signal over the airwaves that actually takes a lot of spectrum. So there was pressure to actually move everything to digital. Why? To stuff more channels inside the same spectrum, but also increase resolution, add new fancy features uh, such as multi-channel audio. So the digitalization of broadcasting was something that took about 20 years, starting in the early 90s, finished in 2010. It was enabled by the invention of good codecs, video codecs. So if uh, an, SD, an HD stream is about 1.5 gigabits per second, the same signal sent over a satellite feed or a cable uh, is compressed down to around 10 megabits, maybe, low, maybe less, maybe more, using H.264. So we have good codecs. We keep improving the codecs every every other year, so the codecs, codecs improve, we're able to extract more redundancy from the images as the years go by. Same thing with audio, started with mono, uh, audio on the black and white TV, stereo, multi-channel. Inter interestingly, it's still a push model. We're still delivering content out of the playout channel. We're still pushing it over um, over an antenna now, antennas or uh, cables. So in North, Amer uh, North America, we have ATSC, we have cable lab standards. In Europe, you have DVB-T, so terrestrial, the, uh, the airwaves, or S, satellites. It's still something that we author once, we, we transmit from one source, and it's consumed by multiple receivers. It, works re it worked really well. It still works really well. Um, I'll skip the transport stream. So... And this is something I really love. This is what powered the, uh, the, 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 the online streaming revolution. So I don't, some of you are old, as old as me. And remember real player, real video, or uh, flash video back in the days? The, the attempt at online distribution was made using the same principles, trying to stream to a destination. I have my phone, I have my PC. I'm sending packets using us over a socket to destinations, to multiple destinations. Uh, this is not what the internet is good, <laughs> good at. Sending packets over U UDP over the internet is actually pretty terrible. So, of course, it didn't work. There were very, a few high-profile failures, like a U2 concert that was supposed to be accessible for the whole, whole planet, and I think five persons were able to, <laughs> to watch it. Uh, so, and I love when this happens. The industry just took a pause, looked at the problem, and flipped everything around. And it's, it, it, from a software architecture point of view, this is amazing. Just, we've been doing it right for online, for airwaves distribution, for the internet. Let's flip it completely around. So instead of sending you video over a socket and sending you small video packets, what we're going to do is we're going to treat everything as small files. So I'm recording content, uh, like 10 second, five second segment, 10 second segments of video, and I'm putting these fragments, these chunks, on an HTTP folder, a folder accessible through HTTP, and I'm writing every five seconds or every uh, 10 seconds a small manifest, a small JSON, XML, or text document on the side describing the relationship of these blocks. That's it, or there's nothing else. This is, this is what HTTP streaming is all about. And it's beautiful in its simplicity, and it leverages what the internet is good, for, uh, good at. So the internet has amazing CD and content distribution networks, Akamai, Amazon. Uh, it's actually very, very good with caching. So if you're downloading a file from uh, YouTube or a chunk of media from YouTube or Netflix, it is very unlikely that you're actually downloading the file from Netflix directly. Your local ISP, your local uh, internet provider, your local building may have caches and may cache all these blocks. So next year, when Stranger Things fives will, uh, 5 will, uh, will come out, uh, the act of publishing the show for Netflix is really just enabling the permission in a folder. 
That's it. And then the, 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 um, the players, the, the logic now is in the player. So the player is now pulling the chunks it needs, the resolution it wants, so adaptive bitrate. I may want the HDR version. On Netflix, you have to pay for the HDR, UHD version. If you, don't, you haven't paid for it, then it will select the lower resolution. If your, line, if your internet connection goes down or is, goes into a period of trouble, then it will automatically degrade to a smaller resolution. All of that is enabled by the, uh, this new distribution mechanism called HTTP streaming or HTTP live streaming. Two standards, HLS, HTTP, video, HTTP live streaming, or MPEG dash. They're pretty much the same thing with different uh, manifests. Uh, so this image on YouTube, we're all geeks, so this is for us. If you right-click on, uh, on the video player on YouTube and you look at stats for nerds, you will see this kind of information. So which video codec it's selected. It may have multiple video codecs. You know what? AV1 is the brand new fancy codec that is super efficient. If you're if this, no, this is an old laptop. If a new laptop has AV1 support on the GPU or on the CPU, YouTube may actually select the EV1 stream because it's better, high quality, lower, uh, smaller file size. If you're using an old uh, uh, device, it may go back to uh, VP6 or VP7 or whatnot. So the browser is, is, can actually tell you all of this information. So if you're a geek, it's interesting. However, so whatever the distribution mechanism, the content still needs to be produced. So it has little impact on a company like Grass Valley. We actually have more content providers, more content owners who want to put something over the air, so it's more business for us. OK, and then digital production. So trying to do all of the fancy programming in the analog world using analog consoles, you can guess what the look is and what it looks like. So. Digital production has been invented, has been with us for a, a very long time, early 1990s. However, look at the bit rates. So in SD, we were talking about two seven, we're talking about 270 megabits per second per stream. So if you're in SD in 1989, you're, uh, the typical com computer is like an Atari or an Amiga. There's no way you can you can do a live production with multiple streams uh, reliable for at the broadcast level with these bit, these uncompressed bit rates. Uh, if you go to HD, so in, over the year we added the uh, uh, HD interlace, HD progressive, and UHD, so the bit rates come up. This connector at the top right, it's called, well, it's actually an SD, SDI cable, so serial interface with a BNC connector allowing us to lock the, the cables. Still works really well, still heavily in use in this industry. Uh, and also you need to, to invent a mechanism to time all the devices, so the signals uh, take time to be delivered over these cables. The processing delays everywhere accumulate, so you need to retime all video frames. So timing information was sent as a, a small burst in these cables so that the devices know when the next burst happens and it can line up all the video frames. We're in the, 20, uh, we're in the next millennium now, so uh, the industry went to IP, of course. So instead of uh, relying on, kind of, um, stand, uh, on these kind of uh, specialist connectors, Try to do the same thing over 20, what we call SIMT2110. It's a video standard that will that dictates, that mandates the use of RTP to transport uncompressed video at very, very high frame rate with very specific packet pacing. So uh, you need to send your UDP packets every 7.4 microsecond. If not, then the receiving device may not have enough memory to buffer the packets that you're sending. So try to to deliver packets at a frame rate that is, as a packet rate that is so high and so precise on Windows, on Linux, well, you have to bypass the kernel. So you have to find ways to just go beside the, current, the kernel and talk directly to the network adapter. You need to make sure that you never are interrupted by interrupts. You need to make sure that your thread is never descheduled. It's a hard problem to implement, but we're geeks. We love that, and this is what we do. Okay, so. What I showed you was what we call traditional broadcasting. Uh, it works very well. It's still heavily in use today, either with SDI cables or IP connections and switches. However, it has a lot, many problems. First, the main problem is the lack of agility. If you're creating um, a broadcast truck, an OB truck, or a broadcast studio, you need to acquire equipment. How many production switchers do I need? How many encoders do I need? Uh, how many splitters do I need? These cables are point-to-point -point connection. Cabling, everything takes forever. So, for example, the, the typical use case is a broadcaster that is broadcasting the Olympics. Most of the years, 
they don't need all the gears they, the gear they have, but they need enough gear to to uh, to broadcast the Olympics. So it's, it's the total opposite of flexibility. You actually are locked down in the equipment you own, and most of the equipment equipment that you own is either idling or not being used at all. So it's very very expensive. It's very capex oriented. You're it's capital expenditure, but you cannot loan it. Well, you can loan the equipment, but you cannot just use it on demand. So. At Grass Valley, we've re a couple of years ago, we built something. We started working on something called AMP, so Agile Media Processing Platform. We were looking at microservices. We were looking at Kubernetes. We were looking at uh, SaaS services. And we were wondering, how do we do all of that but in the cloud? Actually, should everything be in the cloud? Uh, and w the answer was no. <laughs> so we uh, we decided to split the problem in two layers, the control and orchestration plane that can live in the, in the cloud. It makes total sense to use SaaS services to perform all of these notifications, eventing, logging, um, authorization, state management. Just do it in the cloud. It's perfect for that. It's reliable. Uh, however, what about the media processing? So that's why we have this split, the control plane and the data plane. And we choose to run the data plane where it makes the most sense. For some customers, some broadcasters who have 24-7 operations, why would you stream up to the cloud, bring it back down on-premise, and then send it to your customers? Why do you add this latency and this risk? So for some customers, it make, makes much more sense to run everything on-premise. For other customers, it makes a lot of sense to run in the cloud instead because they don't have a lot of equipment. They may not even have a facility. They may be a virtual broadcaster who do not even own an office. So this flexibility is something that AMP will provide. Of course, it opens up lots of uh, interesting problems. So how do you stream video to the operator if the operator is across the world? How do you make sure that the video you stream doesn't have a second of latency? A second of latency for us is way too much. We're talking about frames of latency across long distances. We've tried to bend the speed of light and go faster than light. We failed. So we have to live with the speed of light and the RTT, the uh, round trip times over the internet. So we used an edge computing model or a hybrid model. So the cloud actually can move down. So sometimes people call that fog computing where the services can actually be brought down on premise. So we can actually run our data, data plane anywhere, on prem or in the cloud, a any cloud provider as well. So typically, broadcast products are built as Stacks, application stacks, they have their own state management, their own, uh, own IO, own pixel processing logic that is suitable for their own task. All stuck, of course, in a big monolith. I won't tell you what a monolith is. So how do we break that? How do we use good practices, good microservice practices? Well, we have to use them where it makes sense. For example, we want the services to be loosely coupled, of course, individually upgradable. That's a given for microservices. Bounded context, and the problem here is the scope, the knowledge scale in that stack. So we talk about um, full stack developers, front end developers, back end developers. If you can find a full stack developer, you're super happy. This is mega stack. This is beyond, well beyond full stack because you have to do your I/O using potentially C++. You have to do your pixel processing in CUDA, so you have to know about GPUs. You may want to do pixel processing on if you don't have a GPU or you want to accelerate some elements on the CPU. You may want to use uh, a SIMD instructions such as AVX on Intel or Neon on ARM. Backend services in .NET 6, uh, Kubernetes, Redis, Mongo, Re uh, React, Angular. So if you're the unicorn who knows all of that, please come talk to me <laughs> because we have a hard time finding that kind of people. Uh, it's, very, it's next to impossible to find someone who knows all of that. So that's why we actually broke the, uh, the microservice into bounded application context, but also are we likely to find someone or a team who's able to cross these boundaries, so technical boundaries and also uh, business boundaries. So if we broke down everything into smaller microservices, we can then assemble them and create more functionality for our customer. This customer wants to broadcast the Olympics. They need some effects processing. They need some encode, some decode. We just assemble the microservices, create a nice uh, modular user interface that uses the microservice, and then they have something that they can run on the cloud, on-prem. So it's total flexibility. And we just rebuilt the whole suite of applications and products that we have at Grass Valley using this microservice uh, approach. So I have 
four minutes left, so I'm going to go very rapidly over that. So AMP is real. It's used by very high-profile customers. So about three years ago, in March 2020, something happened. You all know what happened. So people were, tr we broadcasters were not allowed during the lockdown to send a technical director, some uh, broadcast engineers on site to do anything. It was total lockdown for everyone, including media. So it was very hard to produce anything. So there was a need for agility. There was a need to, well, we're in, there's a deep problem here. We need to, the show must go on. We need something on air. We were almost ready with AMP. We were version 1.0. So we, were, we started doing almost the day after the lockdown live production shows using a technical director in his garage with his own landline controlling a production switcher, looking at a multiviewer receiving WebRTC streams or a, a multiviewer streamed over WebRTC so he could actually look at all the cameras. But these were virtual cameras where people commenting during the e-gaming season of FIFA, I don't remember the name, FIFA World, Se World Series e-gaming e -gaming, uh, contest, were actually in their home with a green screen, recording themselves with a camera and feeding into this guy in the garage, and it worked. So this is the ultimate flexibility. If you can do that, you have the total flexibility. And this, this actually worked really, really well. Another use case, well, Discovery Eurosport, now owned by Warner Media, is using AMP uh, every day for broadcasting, TV, sports, and we did the Olympics with AMP, asset management, play out, recording, all, all of the tools we use. So it's during the Olympics, hundreds of thousands of hours, petabytes of content just for three weeks. So when I was talking about indexing and finding your assets, if you have to go through all the frames that you recorded to find the, the, the highlight you want, you're going to search for a very long time. So multiple channels, 200 feet. So broadcasters now, they have a lot of channels. It's not really just the two channels you see on air. They actually have different variation. It's the same channel with a different audience or a different kind of uh, branding, different kind of uh, different languages. So they actually have lots and lots of channels they have to play at the same time. I went very rapidly on over that, I'm sorry. So we have two minutes for a Q&A session. Any questions I could answer? Do we have any geeks here who have uh, any questions? <laughs> See, he needs redundancy. Two, microf <laughs> two microphones, my failure mode, my backup. <laughs> Well, just tell me your question, I'll just uh, okay. repeat it. Okay, so, uh, great session. Thank you so much for this. Uh, Thank you. Really insightful. So one of the problems that um, you know, I could understand really is um, moving away from a hardware controller to a control plane in the cloud. Yes. Right? Hello. Hello. Oh, this is better. <laughs> yeah. So uh, moving from the hardware-based controller, which requires, like, you know, um, frame level, um, you know, um, precision yes. when we are doing the broadcast, moving that to cloud. And of course, we know that internet is built to fail at times, right? Absolutely. So uh, what was the process of, you know, making sure that that control plane is highly available because yes. for, for something like an Olympics or even uh, a, a live broadcast, right? So if, if one of the packets, one of the signal gets lost, yes everything crashes. You have a full stack of redundancy uh, approaches that we use. Uh, I'll, I'll cover just a few. For example, if you're doing playout, typically in playout, the content exists ahead of time. So that your playout node may be on-premise, it's controlled from the cloud, but it knows what the schedule is for the next 24 hours. So it may actually cache the content and keep a copy local. So the orchestration already transferred the schedule. If there's an outage for a minute mm -hmm. and it comes back, well, it's going to carry on. If you're streaming video over the internet uh, and you're contributing, well, the streaming format, the streaming protocol have what we call ARQ, adaptive re packet request. So I'm expecting packet one, two, three, four, five. 
I'm missing packet four. It's been more than X millisecond. Please resend this packet. So you have resiliency built in the protocols. If that's not enough and you're scared about multi-region outages, which kind of never happens, you can actually have content in two separate regions or two separate pr cloud provider. It right. gets expensive. And then you receive the streams that is replicated from different regions. Whenever we deploy our, uh, our clusters, of course, we make sure that we have partition ac across multiple AZs in, uh, in, the, in, the, the, in the data center, but if you need more than that, then you actually can go across multiple cloud providers to provide perfect resi resiliency. And we have customers who, who do that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? That's it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.